this morning, uh, which is Unwrapping Hope. You guys probably knew that one was coming, right? So, uh, so welcome. I see there's a lot of new faces here. I'm glad that uh, some of you have come to join us for the first time, perhaps, this morning. And today, for the rest of the, and for the rest of the Advent season, each Sunday morning, we're going to be examining some of those mysteries of Christmas. And you've, if you had that invite card, you've seen them already. And, and honestly, they actually just line up with the Advent candle that week, so the theme goes through the whole service then. And the theme is unwrapping the mysteries of Christmas. And really, these mysteries are not hard to read about, so they aren't mysterious in that way, because Scripture clearly teaches about them. The mysteries we are examining are comprehended with the mind, but they are only revealed when God, through his word, brings light into the hearts of people, bringing his regenerative work into our hearts. I want to be up front with you who are guests with us this morning. The people of Oasis Church have been, for many weeks now, been praying for people they know. Neighbors and coworkers and friends and family and other acquaintances, the prayers are for some of you who are sitting among us today. And the prayers are that God would draw you to himself and cause you to see your need to be reconciled with him, which can only happen through faith in Jesus Christ. We prayed for you because we love you and we care about you. And we say this without apology here at Oasis Church. You see, when someone has been gripped by the truth of the good news about Jesus, they feel compelled to share the reason for the hope that they have. They have hearts that desire for others to find this same truth, the truth that will change your life, but more importantly, determine your eternity. This morning, we've lit the candle of hope already, and now we're going to look to God's word to see how the, Christ, the Christmas story reveals the hope of God given to all who follow Jesus and put faith in him. To see why people are in such a desperate need of hope, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. In Genesis 1, we learn that God created the heavens and the earth. Everything came from nothing. There was no material to work with. No laws of physics or chemistry or other sciences, not even time. In an instant, God spoke and there was light. The Bible tells us he spoke the world into existence and that he considered it good. And he created the first man and the first woman and they were completely innocent. They didn't have any violations of any law, at least not yet. God gave them one rule, a fairly simple one. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of, the, of good and evil. Without that knowledge, they remained completely innocent. They were in paradise. They had perfect health. They had perfect enjoyment. They had all their needs provided for. This they had because they did not yet have the knowledge of good and evil. Yet you probably know the story. The woman ate and the man ate. Adam was the one given the responsibility by God, but both Adam and Eve found themselves guilty before God. Breaking a command of God is also called sin, a word that most of you know, but I don't want to assume everybody knows what it means. Sin is missing the mark. God gives us standards to live by, and we all miss that mark. The other thing that was perfect before the broken rule was their relationship with God. They communicated with him in a way that no other human after them has yet. They experienced daily communication with God, unhindered by any sin or any problems, and they enjoyed him. It could be said that they, as God's first creation, were perfectly glorifying him and enjoying him. But they ate the forbidden fruit, and everything changed in a radical way. Their relationship with God was immediately broken. The world they lived in began to rebel against them, having been cursed by God so that disease and trouble and weeds and painful child labor were suddenly part of their reality. They were people at first who did not need any hope. Scripture tells us that nobody hopes for what they already see. We hope for things we cannot see or experience now. 
And as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, among all the uncomfortable feelings they were now experiencing for the first time was loss. And yet, in the middle of all that, and God gave them punishments and gave them uh, curses to the earth that they had to deal with, he offered them hope in the middle of that. He cursed the serpent who had tempted Eve by saying this in Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Her offspring would crush the serpent. In other words, some future man would win victory over the serpent forever. So there was hope, but it was for the future. But God also showed his love and compassion for Adam and Eve despite their violation of his law, and he made for Adam and Eve garments of animal skins to clothe them. And this was to point to a system later used by God's people where sacrifices were needed to atone for the sins of the people. The Bible teaches that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And God demonstrated this by shedding the blood of animals in order to grant forgiveness to those first sinners of their first sin. And then he clothed them. In the sacrificial system, people usually... uh, had to provide their own sacrifice. But in this case, God himself provided the sacrifice. And we're going to see as we unwrap this mystery of hope that this would not be the first time that God provided a sacrifice for one in need. For when we take a moment to consider Abraham in just a little bit, we will see that. But first, let's move on to Noah. We move forward in the generations of mankind And we see that from the very first sin, things got much worse. By the time of Noah, mankind had become exceedingly wicked. Genesis 6, 5 says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And we know what happened. Noah built the ark in obedience to God, his sacrifice being a sacrifice of obedience, We're told that once all the animals and Noah's family entered the ark, God shut him in. The door was made secure. Later, Jesus would call himself the door. Whoever entered the the ark by the door would be saved. And Jesus says, whoever enters through him will be saved. God gave Noah hope by the ark and through his promise, just as he gave Adam and Eve hope by sacrificing animals to make clothes for them and also by his word. Well, Noah survived the flood. Not soon after the flood, the population of people was growing rapidly, but they were not obeying the command of God that they were to go and spread out across the earth. Instead, they came to one central spot and they tried to build a city and a tower. So God then confused their language. We can read about that in Genesis 11, starting at verse 7. It says that God concluded this, Come, let us go down. And there confused their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So once again, people needed hope. And soon, God would again give hope as he gave it through a man named Abraham. Well, God gave his word and the animal skins to help provide hope to Adam and Eve and gave Noah his word and the ark itself and the door that he sealed. Abraham had God's word, and this was so sufficient for him to have hope. Scripture tells us that Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. In other words, his faith was salvation. His faith was in the word of God. A lot of accounts are written about Abraham, and one of those is another example of his faith. He was told by God to sacrifice his own son. And this was a test that God gave Abraham As he and his son Isaac were going to the place of sacrifice, that bright young man noticed that they don't have an animal with them. And he asked Abraham about it. 
And Abraham replied in Genesis 22, 8, and he said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they both went, of them went together. God will provide for himself the lamb. Isn't that interesting language? John the Baptist would later say that Jesus was the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Once again, God was providing for himself the sacrifice needed to restore the relationship between sinful people and a holy God. God had chosen to bring about the salvation of all mankind through certain people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, also known as Israel, as well as the many stories of God's faithfulness in Scripture, we also find that he appointed prophets to speak to his people, constantly pleading with sinners to turn from their sin. But also through those prophets, he offered hope that one day a Messiah would come. That means anointed one. You have also heard the word translated as Christ. One prophet who spoke of the coming servant of the Lord was Isaiah. Now this Isaiah, or as the British say, Isaiah, is one of the most respected of the Jewish prophets. And over 700 years before Jesus was born, he made this prophecy, speaking of the Messiah to come. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has, been, has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation... Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, we shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, I assure you, If someone knew even the basics about the life of Jesus, and particularly about his persecution on the cross, they would probably conclude that Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. And it is. It was written around 700 years before Jesus fulfilled the prophecy, and many of the specific points of that prophecy were fulfilled in the life of Jesus, and particularly in the death of Jesus and his persecution. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, when is he going to start talking about Christmas? I'm almost there, I promise you. I want to make sure that you have seen this pattern. All throughout human history, ever since the first sin, 
Mankind has desperately needed hope. And God has given reason for people to hope. The hope is not that they could do enough deeds to cancel out their sin. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. No good deeds can cover the cost of our sin. Blood must be shed. God is holy. And in his holiness, he can't tolerate sin. And yet he has shown that despite his anger towards sin and the fact that wrath is being piled up for those who keep sinning, he is also a merciful God. He provided the sacrifice Adam and Eve needed. He provided the ark to save Noah. He kept his promise to Abraham. And many more stories are found of God's mercy and graciousness towards even sinners. He himself can provide sacrifices for the sins of people. He's the giver of hope. Before Jesus arrived on the scene, there were about 400 years when it seemed like God was silent. There were no prophets speaking. The people were in great darkness. The last prophet to speak was Malachi, about 400 years before the birth of Christ. And he prophesied that there would be two messengers. One of those we identify as Jesus, the other as John the Baptist. In Malachi 3.1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And the very last chapter of the last prophet to speak in the Old Testament tells us this, Malachi 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wing. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Even though people's hearts had grown cold toward God, yet he offered them hope. The prophet Malachi then had his prophecies fulfilled in John the Baptist and in Jesus the Messiah of Israel. In Luke, we find that Zechariah the priest and his wife would give birth to John the Baptist. The angel or the messenger of God told Zechariah about his son in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 14. He said, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience of the wisdom to the just, um, and sorry, and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. You see? fulfillment of prophecy again but that's not the only prophecy fulfilled in the christmas story and more hope is yet to be found in this good news next we see the angel gabriel speak to mary about the baby she would give birth to in chapter 1 verse 32 he says he will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the lord god will give to him the throne of his father david and he will reign over the house of jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end and then in verse 35, after Mary asked, he answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. In the birth of Jesus, God was keeping his promise to the many whom he had given hope to all the way back to Adam and Eve. He provided the sacrifice for them killing the animals to cover them. 
For Noah, the door of the ark was God's provision for him to have salvation from the flood that was coming. God honored the faith of Abraham, who told Isaac with confidence that God would provide for himself a lamb for the sacrifice, and God did that. Today, we are in great need to examine ourselves against the laws of God. You see, every one of us is a sinner. We tend to think little of our sin. Even as Adam and Eve might have thought, well, what's the big deal? It's just some fruit. We've got fruit over here. We've got fruit over here. Why can't we have that fruit? We think little of our sin. Yet, let us remember that God is pure and holy and perfection. And he is the creator, and we are the creation. And he gets to make the rules. And breaking any rule, even those that we might not think are so serious, is cosmic treason against our good God. One of the most important things we must come to conclude is that our sin is wretched and horrible, and we deserve terrible punishment for it. God's commandments are laws we've broken. Lying, cheating, stealing, lusting. There's no one who hasn't broken the law of God. And in fact, if we're all honest, we've all broken it many times. If one single sin is cosmic treason against a holy God, how much more does a lifetime of sin cause us to be in a really bad position? We deserve death because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, what are wages? Wages are what you're paid for the work you've done. In most jobs, the better you do, the higher your wages. How good are you at sinning? How much death do you deserve? And perhaps you say, well, I can only die once. However, the wrath of God is being revealed. Sinners are heaping up wrath against themselves, and it will be poured out for all eternity. Hell is real. There is an eternal punishment for sinners. And you don't simply burn away and cease existing at some point, as some false teachers teach. You will live forever one way or another, either comforted in God's heaven or having his wrath poured out on you for all eternity in hell. Nothing could be more important or serious for you than to figure out whether what I'm saying is true. Nothing is more paramount than how you will spend your eternity. This life is brief. brief. Some of you in this room will not be alive for sure in 10 years, perhaps earlier. You could get in the car this very day and go through an intersection and be killed in an instant. You see, life is short. It's fragile. And your sin is serious. And you have earned some mighty high wages for it. Your sin is heaping up God's wrath. Perhaps you're wondering where the hope is. Well, you must understand the disease before you look for a cure. I'm trying to make you sense the reality of the seriousness of sin so that you may flee to the mercy of God offered through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. I knew a family once and their son got leukemia. Within a very short time, these parents were suddenly experts on that disease. They were speaking like doctors. They'd tell me about their appointments, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. They knew the language behind the blood tests and the treatment options. They were like encyclopedias of knowledge that, of, of knowledge that they only a few, year, few weeks ago knew nothing about. These were not people who were normally heavy readers, and they became well-read on the topic of leukemia. Why? Because their boy was precious to them. They wanted to know everything they could in order to try to bring him back to health. But what if they had never received the diagnosis? If you do not receive the diagnosis, or if you don't believe the diagnosis, you won't seek help. I pray God's Spirit cause you to understand the guilt you bear before God, so that you may seek his mercy through Jesus. You see, God kept his promise. He provided for himself a fitting sacrifice, that perfect sinless Jesus who was indeed the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the Bible teaches that all who will publicly and clearly acknowledge him as Lord and Savior and who truly believe in their hearts that he's risen from the dead will be saved. And God has kept his promise. 
In Hebrews 6, starting at verse 13, we read this. When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled for refuge. We who have fled for refuge must ha- might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Have you fled for refuge in Jesus. This is our blessed hope. Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, who came to seek and save the lost, who came to testify to the truth, who came submitted to God the Father as the sacrifice, who could turn away the wrath that God has towards sinners. Why? Because on that cross, Jesus took the wrath of God in full onto himself. He deserved none of that. Yet he willingly went. And because of the wrath of God that has been poured out on Christ, we who put faith in him have a hope that is a sure and steadfast anchor to our souls. With Jesus came the kingdom of God. Jesus said, the time is now fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Hope is available for you today. It is found in Jesus. If you have never put faith in him, you should be very concerned. Yet my words will not convince you to have faith. There's only one way anyone comes to faith, and that is by the Spirit of God. I pray that the Spirit of God will cause you to fear the wrath of God because of your sins, and that you will tremble at the face and the thought of facing his judgment. That fear is your friend if it causes you to turn to Christ. I mentioned from the very beginning that our prayers have been that people in our lives would be touched with this good news of Jesus Christ To fully and appreciate the good news, though, you must first comprehend the bad news. The bad news is that you and I are sinners, fully deserving of God's wrath, and there is nothing we can do, no good deeds, no generosity, nothing that can make up for our offenses against God. The bad news is that without some provision for us, we have no hope. The bad news is that unless we find an acceptable sacrifice that God would receive on our behalf to turn his wrath away from us, we will face his wrath, and it will be terrible. An eternity of hell. Hell is real, and it is a terrible place. However, in the Christmas story, we have unwrapped hope. There is hope for us. Because God established a pattern in the Old Testament, a pattern of providing sacrifices for sinners, a pattern of showing mercy. And in the birth of Christ and in the story of Christmas, we see again how God was preparing for himself a sacrifice one that would be sufficient for all who would trust in it as their own. That sacrifice was his own son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life as an example to us, who took our sin and the pain of the punishment and took all the wrath of God upon himself on that cross. In doing this, he satisfied God's wrath on behalf of all who put faith in him. And this gives us hope that our relationship with God, severed in the garden by the first sin and severed again each time we sin, can be restored through the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us in order that our sins may be forgiven. Jesus then rose from the dead, conquering sin and death and showing us that he had power over death and as a proof that we who believe in him may have hope that one day with the power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, 
that power will also reside in us. And all of this is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved by faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. All you have to do is believe. And even the faith to believe is God's gift. There's hope to all if you believe. But maybe you're saying, well, I don't have that faith. And I want that faith, but I don't really have it. I would like to believe what you believe. Then cry out to God and beg for his mercy for you, that he would give you the belief that you need to have salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say a prayer, and then we're going to prepare for our time of communion together. Lord, bless your message that I just delivered. I pray, Lord, that what was said will be impacting the hearts of people, that it would impact the hearts of those that have come to faith in Christ, Lord, and those that are not yet redeemed, that you would convict them of their sins and convince them of this truth, that they may join us in rejoicing in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And Lord, as we go to this time of communion together, I pray that you'll bless that as well. In Jesus' name, amen.